All right, so I think you've heard the term operator used once or twice this morning, maybe. Uh, so I want to give you um, a kind of overview of the state of operators, some of the tools we have to build them, um, who's building things, what they're building, all that kind of stuff, um, and uh, happy to talk more. Um, so when you look at uh, applications running on Kubernetes, um, it is really interesting to kind of dissect the history there. Um, and if you look at it at first, um, this really maps to when certain kube feature sets were added. Um, and this kind of gave you new capabilities for running certain types of applications. Um, in the beginning, we just had these stateless apps. Um, we've got uh, replica sets and deployments. You could scale these things out horizontally. That's great. Um, you know, everybody's uh, running um, very simple things. Um, but what you really want to get to is stateful applications. Um, you want, uh, you know, having staple storage, you want that storage to follow you around the cluster. Um, we started adding things like uh, staple sets, the container storage interface, um, all these new parts of Kube. Um, and now you could actually be pretty productive on Kube. You're starting to run staple databases. Um, you know, this meets a lot of enterprise needs. Um, but what you don't get is full distributed systems. Um, you, do, you have these properties inside of your applications that aren't modeled in just Kubernetes objects like a staple set. You want to do uh, data rebalancing. You want to do uh, auto scaling. Um, you want to do seamless upgrades. You want to get to the vision that Reza just uh, laid out. And you can't get there with just Kube alone. You've got this like all these things that need to happen inside of your application. There's this unique knowledge there. Um, and that's got to be captured somewhere to be able to run that on Kubernetes. Um, so what does that? Um, it's an operator. Um, so an operator is taking that unique knowledge that it takes to run your application um, from you know, everything that would be in like a run book or that you would keep on like a wiki or something you might just have in your head for, oh, when that thing happens, I know you got to go poke this bit over here to make it work again. Um, all that stuff you can actually automate and you can express that in code so that you don't have a human having to be there. Um, and so embedding that op, uh, ops knowledge into an application is an operator. Um, so you've got you know, uh, version 1.1.2 of your operator. You add some new functionality, um, put a new version out. It knows how to upgrade from version to version. Um, you need to go uh, start this tier first and then warm up this uh, cache or upgrade the database uh, schema before we upgrade the front end. Whatever um, types of things that you need to do every day to get your job done, um, you can express that in an operator. And what's really exciting about this is because it's a, a nice self-contained unit, um, is if you're distributing software, which either that means uh, to another group inside of your company, um, you're going to distribute software to a CI system, or you actually publish and sell software, um, you need to give this to somebody to run. And as you have these multiple tiers, um, getting a customer up and running with your software is actually pretty hard. I mean, even if they have Kube, Kube is already worlds better than you know trying to orchestrate uh, raw VMs. Um, but you need to be able to do all this stuff correctly, and that's what an operator lets you do. Um, so what's really exciting about an operator is that you're just using these kube primitives. Uh, so you have these really flexible app architectures that are possible. You can do anything that you need to do um, basically in kube. You can, you can run um, staple tiers, stateless tiers, auto scale some of those tiers, auto scale them at different rates, um, whatever you need to do, and then you know, build on all those kube primitives for um, doing uh, scheduling across availability zones and the failover, moving storage around like I talked about. Um, so you're not reinventing those core concepts. Um, you know, there's a, a group of thousands and thousands of contributors to Kube that are doing a really great job at those low-level bits. What you need to bring to the table is your application's knowledge, what actually needs to happen when this needs to run. And then you know, you're not just going to run it once, but you're gonna, this thing has a life of its own, you know, running um, across Black Fridays and um, all the holiday rushes and whatever you, the event is that makes your business run. Um, you have a uniform story for debugging and deploying that. Um, so you've got different teams that can share operational expertise with each other. Um, you know, you've got teams that are shipping software at different rates, and they all know how to debug that. Um, so whoever's on call is not going to be stuck um, kind of trying to figure out what's going on, reading these wiki pages, um, you know, when it's, it's crunch time at 2 a.m. when something's down. And then a uh, key to uh, Reza's whole vision there is that this is truly hybrid. You're just using Kubernetes primitives under the hood. And so uh, what you get is something that can run anywhere you can run kube. Um, and so if you're distributing software, do you want the largest ecosystem possible? Yes, of course, that you can address your market. Um, and so this keeps you truly hybrid, and you're not locked into any certain uh, technology stack or cloud provider. Um, 
Yeah, do we want that? Does that sound good? Um, now let's talk about how we get that. Um, so uh, as Reza said, the operator framework uh, was birthed um, out of our experience at CoreOS as well as at Red Hat building these operators and interacting with the community and their needs. Um, and so this helps you, helps you get a, a common application framework uh, set up to run this type of software. Um, you know, but you don't need to be mucking around with the internals of the Kubernetes API and how to do your reconciliation loops and all this. Um, so we set all that up for you. Uh, it's a bunch of code generation um, to use uh, this format to build a set of coherent, consistent apps, um, but with a framework that you um, are familiar with. So we've got um, a few different flavors. Uh, we've got our Go SDK, our Ansible SDK, and our Helm SDK, and I'm gonna dig into each one of those in a second. And then if you are just consuming applications uh, on Kubernetes, um, you wanna keep these applications up to date. You wanna uh, manage them in a sane way. Your day two operations are very important. Um, and so uh, this is a, a way, a conduit for the um, application developers to get you a stream of updates in a sane way to manage and apply those um, that is really, really nice for security. Um, this, uh, this philosophy that we had at CoreOS was just, you know, bugs are inevitable. Um, the next heart bleed, the next shell shock, whatever it is, is out. And the only thing that gives you defense against that is just updating very quickly. You need to have automated systems for patching um, you know, your Linux layer, your applications, your front end. Um, you just need to be able to do this. Um, and we've, you know, the web has become dramatically more secure as automated upgrades have come to our web browsers. And so we want to bring all of that experience from, uh, from the web into backend infrastructure. Um, and so this is really, really important for security and you know, nobody wants to be in the headlines for having their unsecured MongoDB cluster that leaked 700 million email addresses like it did last week. Um, you need to have those best practices embedded in something such that you can't do that. Um, we have a Mongo operator, it knows how to do this for you. TLS, full security, no, no, no brainer. You, know, you don't need to uh, worry about this stuff. Um, and so that's what the operator framework gives you. Um, as Reza mentioned, there's uh, three different pillars to this. Um, there's on the build side, you've got to build these operators and we have our SDKs. Um, you want to then start running them. Um, you might not be running just one or two of these operators, but there might be 30 or 40 of them on a cluster. And so you want to have a lifecycle manager there to help you, um, you know, run and upgrade those and make sure that they're staying up to date. Um, and then once you're operating these at scale, um, you want to start looking at some metrics and start correlating trends between different operators, uh, make sure everything is running smoothly. Um, and then, you know, this uh, is the backbone for metering uh, to do auto scaling of your tiers and things like that. Um, so all this is open source. It's on GitHub. Um, we've got um, all of these uh, different projects as well as many more. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at the code if you're interested in how some of this works. Uh, contribute to it, of course, as well. Um, and I want to dig into a few of these pillars. Um, really important for understanding operators is this maturity model. The idea that, you know, um, there's an installation experience, which can be really great and automated, but that's kind of not where you want to be. Um, you actually want to get into seamless upgrades, doing full lifecycle management of your applications. Um, and so as you get uh, towards the right of this diagram, uh, that is where we think we want these operators to be over time. This full autopilot, the thing that you would get from an Amazon RDS or any of the other hosted services um, on, from a cloud provider um, for you know, horizontal and vertical auto scaling, um, kind of this application just works the way that you would expect if you just naively came in here and said, hey, I just want this database to store my data. Doesn't matter if it's terabytes of data or a megabyte. Um, so on the bottom, you see the three SDKs that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Helm uh, SDK is really great for getting kind of phase one into phase two. So you're, you're doing some simple upgrades, but um, you know, Helm doesn't have a lot of uh, logic there for doing any of these complex operations that we were talking about, data rebalancing and that type of thing. Um, and that's where you get into our Ansible and Go SDKs, um, where you can you know, do these complex, rich operations. Um, we're gonna talk more about that. The operator SDK um, is, uh, kind of feeds in these three into a common testing framework um, and verification. Uh, we have this uh, concept we call an operator scorecard. And so this is uh, kind of telling you, uh, did I produce my operator correctly? There are a bunch of best practices around um, how it uh, tells its status, um, that it's up and running successfully, um, that it's managing the applications in a smart way. Um, and so we've got a scorecard that you can run against your operator to help you keep you honest there. Um, then eventually we want all of this to end up in Operator Hub so that you can expose your new uh, operator out to the world um, and let them know that they can uh, use your 
open source project, your um, commercial piece of software, um, just a little hobbyist app that you wrote, um, kind of all of those are welcome in Operator Hub. Um, and one thing that I wanted to call out very specifically is this testing framework. If you can picture, um, you've got your database operator, uh, MySQL, Postgres, uh, Mongo, Redis, whatever. Um, you don't want this thing running amok and starts to like, you know, kill all your production instances of your database, and there goes your data. Um, and so testing this is extremely important. So if you picture, um, an operator uh, works just like a lot of Kubernetes um, primitives under the hood, so you've got a deployment and there's this reconciliation loop constantly running that says, oh, uh, the desired replica count is three, um, but it's currently two in the cluster. I know what I need to do. I need to add one to that two to make it three. Um, and you know, there's a piece of code that's constantly doing this. Um, when building an operator, you need to write this code for your application. And testing that is extremely critical so that you know that when one of your uh, leaders of your database uh, fails, for example, that it fails over correctly um, and does whatever it needs to do under the hood to make that a safe operation, you really want to have that bulletproof. Um, really, really don't want to delete uh, data. And this is how we build trust with the community, um, is building in some of these tools so that you don't have to figure out exactly how to instrument your reconciliation loop. Um, we kind of get all this uh, for you for free um, with our operator SDK. Uh, starting down the list, uh, kind of from easiest to hardest, if you will, um, our Helm SDK is really great. You can get started with kind of no code, quote unquote. I know this is Kelsey Hightower's funny joke, um, but you really don't have to write any code for this. Um, you just uh, can take in an existing Helm chart, so if you have an investment in doing this internally, um, this is a really great way to build an operator. And what you're doing is connecting that Helm chart to a reconciliation loop and plugging it into the Kubernetes API. Um, so that you can have this self-service um, uh, invocation of that chart and connecting um, the, if you're familiar with Helm, there's uh, values that you pass in for different little config and it gets templated out into all of your manifests. Um, what you do is add those into a custom resource definition in Kubernetes. This is the official extension mechanism for Kubernetes. Um, and then that is your tunables that you pass in and then outputs uh, this Helm chart that gets run every time that changes. Um, and so this is really great for stateless applications or very simple um, upgrades if you've got like a web front end that just needs to go from like version one to version two, but you know, you can uh, load balance between those and it kind of seamlessly replace it. Um, really great for a Helm operator. Um, but you know, running a database this way, I wouldn't advise it um, because you know, you don't have control over what that data is actually doing when it's getting moved and upgraded. Um, there are certain use cases where you could probably make that work with some of the storage abstractions in Kubernetes. So looking at the Helm SDK under the hood, um, this is what you're actually building here, is uh, we're gonna take this example Tomcat uh, chart, and uh, when you uh, invoke that Helm uh, build command to go build that operator, what you're doing is taking that chart and you're putting it into a container with some Go code that we've written for you, um, and you would interact with it uh, with this Tomcat object um, that you see. And so these are the tunables in that spec uh, field at the very bottom there. Um, for tuning the replica count, uh, the number of active sessions. Um, anything that is in your chart can get passed through there. Um, and then what you do is you have this really great, rich, native Kubernetes experience um, where I'm just saying OC get Tomcats um, across all namespaces. And you can see here, I've got my production and my staging. Um, they're on different versions. Um, they're ready. Um, and this is kind of that experience that your engineers get when they're either debugging something or rolling this out. Um, and then in your CI system, what you're doing is addressing this Tomcat object. It's not you know, this whole pile of Kubernetes manifests that might get out of sync. Um, people, when they're reviewing PRs to that, they don't exactly know what they're looking at. Um, you just get this really nice high level um, config for this application. Uh, and you can build this for anything. This is the beauty of Kubernetes extension mechanism. Um, you can register you know, your own internal web apps and everything like that. Um, so getting a little bit further down the spectrum of um, getting you know, towards that uh, level five maturity model is our Ansible SDK. Um, the Ansible SDK works the exact same way under the hood, except for um, what you're passing in there is a set of playbooks and then um, when to invoke those playbooks. So this is really great for infrastructure teams um, that might not have a lot of like kind of traditional developer experience, uh, where they're you know they're not software engineers, but they they get into this stuff uh, and they you know maybe you have a bunch of automation already written to update DNS records and drain load balancers and you know any of that type of stuff, as well as interacting with Kube directly. Um, in playbooks, you can actually tie those into the Kubernetes event model. So when this node fails, uh, start running this playbook that does something in my application to fail it over. 
um, doing backups, kicking off any of that type of automation. Um, anything you can do with Ansible, you can build into an operator. And then, like I said uh, earlier, you get this really great native kube experience. Um, we're going to do OC get Tomcats again. It looks the exact same. Um, the technology used to build that operator um, you know, is, is different, but you're getting that same experience. Um, and then uh, all the way on um, kind of uh, level five, the, the thing that I think a lot of um, our like, database vendors are going to use to build operators is our Go SDK. And the really exciting thing about the Go SDK is it uses the same tools that uh, Kubernetes developers upstream use to build Kubernetes. Um, everything that you have at your disposal there, um, you can build inside of an operator. Um, and so uh, this is really, really popular for these kind of um, very advanced operators doing auto scaling and data rebalancing, databases, storage tiers, that type of thing. Um, but anything you need to do that has some more complex logic. Um, and, and I stubbed out here at the bottom just uh, kind of a little bit of a reconciliation loop that you would be building um, just to get an idea of, you know, we scaffold a bunch of code for you, but what you need to do is bring that operational knowledge for what to do. Um, and so extending on the Tomcat example here, um, in the beginning you're basically going to say, oh, I want one of these things and none of them exist. Install for the first time my application and all the steps that you need to do to do that. It could be um, very simple or it could be very complex where you're starting this tier before the other tier, you're, um, you want to warm up this cache, you want to you know, uh, generate some TLS certificates to be used internally, whatever it is that needs to happen on startup. Um, and then uh, constantly running this, uh, checking different parameters of your different Tomcat installations, uh, making sure that they haven't drifted from the desired config, and if the desired config has been updated, go through and do whatever steps needed to make that happen. Um, and this can be you know, things like in a database, you might flip one flag from you know, highly available from false to true, and that actually might kick off a whole slew of different operations where now, um, oh, I need to tweak the service, how I route uh, traffic to my pods because I don't have one now, I've got two or three or five. Um, oh, now we're not talking uh, over like local hosts, and so I need to generate some TLS certs, I need to set up an autoscaler for this, I need to configure backups, whatever it is that you need to do. Um, you can bake all that into that operator, but then the experience from using that database, it's just HA true, HA false. Um, very simple, but a lot of complexity happens underneath the hood. One really exciting thing about this is operators are really taking off across the industry, um, and it kind of starts where you would expect with a lot of uh, common you know, infrastructure dependencies, the um, messaging frameworks, big data stacks, um, databases, uh, all that kind of stuff where there is a lot of complexity uh, lurking there. Um, and so that's kind of reflected across a number of the operators uh, that we have in Operator Hub today, um, as well as a lot of kind of closed source um, internal use operators um, at some of these large uh, financial institutions, for example, um, you know, have a lot of um, application tiers that they need to orchestrate in pretty complex ways. Um, and so hopefully we'll, we'll see some of those folks talking about that stuff over time um, as the community grows and grows. Um, as a reminder, uh, you know, using something like the Spark operator means that you don't have to be an expert in Spark. When Spark components get deployed and need to discover each other, you don't need to know how that happens. Um, you need to be, uh, you know, have a high level expertise in um, how you interface with Spark and run your Spark jobs, but you don't really need to care exactly what's going on under the hood there. Um, the experts from that community or that commercial vendor that you're getting that operator from have baked all that expertise in. Um, so what that's doing is freeing you up to do higher level tasks, um, getting your business objectives done versus having to go you know, read a bunch of wiki pages and um, start tweaking all your YAML files for three hours to make sure you get something that actually works. Um, they're kind of taking all that from you. Here's a view of what one of the operators looks like on Operator Hub. Um, and I think it's uh, interesting to kind of break down um, what the lifecycle management tasks that you need are. Um, if you've never used an operator before or you have a little bit of kube experience but not a ton, um, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, we've got some descriptions of this and, um, you know, this has a capability level on that right hand side. So you can see that the Amazon service operator um, just kind of handles basic install. Um, this makes sense because it's mostly orchestrating some Amazon resources, so there's not a lot happening on the cluster itself. Um, and uh, what I want to do is take one of these operators and um, really look at what's going on and focus on these, um, the two right-hand uh, circles here. So you've got this operator running some code that's constantly running this reconciliation loop. 
Um, and then it's interfacing with Kubernetes and a bunch of objects are either being created or destroyed or um, you know, whatever needs to happen in the normal lifespan of this. Um, but let's talk about how that actually happens because um, there's a lot of uh, unique and important security touch points that happen in the communication between these two blocks. So if you think about uh, when you need to install an operator, what needs to happen here? What is, if I'm using this lifecycle manager, what is it doing for me? Or if I'm gonna do this manually, what do I have to do? Um, so first, you've got to install these CRDs. That's the custom resource definition. That's the, the abstraction of your application. Um, that was the, the Tomcat object or our MongoDB object, for example. Um, so you want to install these, and there might not just be one of them, but there might be like five of them. Uh, for example, the MongoDB operator understands how to install three different versions of Mongo, depending on what you want to do. Um, there's the standalone version, um, so that's really great for you know, ephemeral storage on a, a single uh, instance, just kind of dev mode. Um, then there is the um, clustered uh, replica set, um, so that's you know, replicate this between a few different nodes. Um, then there's like the fully sharded cluster where you're kind of controlling which segments of data get uh, instantiated and moved around the cluster. And uh, so you need to find all three of those. Um, if you're not uh, familiar with this operator, you might not know that those, all three of the five of those exist. Um, and so, uh, and then also most importantly, does anything else own these CRDs? Is anybody else managing um, this Postgres object, for example? Um, you don't want two operators trying to manage one cluster. Um, that would be pretty bad. Um, and then the Lifecycle Manager uh, has a really interesting capability, which is doing dependencies between operators. So you can imagine that you know, you're, you're gonna have your um, Spark clusters and your Kafka clusters and your Redis and your Mongo, um, but an application is probably actually gonna consume all of these things um, for different uses inside of it, and so your operators can actually start to work together. Um, so you've got an application um, that has a front end that needs a Postgres database, and it says, hey, I need a Postgres CRD present on the cluster, but I don't provide that. Go, go find me something that does that. Um, and if you have a Postgres operator like Crunchy on the operator hub, you can go say, hey, let me go plug that in. Now these operators are working together um, and they're using that kube API to do it. Um, so you need to figure all that stuff out. You need to make sure you have all the things present to run your application. Then of course, you gotta run this thing. It's a container, it's nothing special. Um, it runs on the host uh, in Kubernetes just like anything else. So you gotta start a deployment for that. It's a deployment because we want it to be highly available. Um, and you know, give it replicas equal one. Um, and then this operator is looking for these other CRDs so it can start um, weaving that capability together. Um, now you've got to start uh, uh, some listening on some namespaces. So if you're familiar with namespaces in Kube, this is how you segment your projects from each other, your, um, your teams, your different environments from each other. And you might only want this operator running across five namespaces per se, or only in this one namespace, I'm just testing it out. Um, so you gotta hook up all the, the proper um, role-based authentication for that. Um, give it a service account that knows how to watch this namespace and that namespace for these specific primitives. Um, maybe uh, you're really security conscious and you don't want this operator being able to read your secrets. Um, you can do that via um, the permission model inside of Kubernetes. Um, and the lifecycle manager can actually help you orchestrate all of this. So you're not even thinking about it this at all. Um, and then of course, you know, you want to give an operator, it's pretty powerful and it needs to be able to read some of your cluster to do its job, but you want it to have that minimal set of permissions possible, um, just to keep it, you know, the blast radius down as small as possible, um, and then bind those to the service account that your operator is using. So all of that happens kind of auto-magically for you inside of the Lifecycle Manager. You don't need to be an expert in any of this, and the authors of an operator are expressing all of these inside of a file that you get uh, that I want to go over because I think it's really interesting. This is a stubbed out version, but we're going to look at a real version. Um, and that's called a cluster service version. That is, the, you know, um, uh, one particular version of a service that's running on your cluster, um, 1.1.2 of the Mongo operator, for example. And what you can express in this file is, um, these are the, the CRDs that either I own or I require. Um, so uh, either I'm going to manage these and install them, and here they are, or um, I depend on this thing, don't install me until I have one of those present on the cluster. Um, and then you're gonna run this container, that's the strategy deployment, um, and give it some permissions. You can have uh, both permissions inside of a namespace, or if your operator is doing something like installing storage for the entire cluster, you can register storage classes and all kinds of stuff at the cluster level as well. Um, and then of course, um, running that deployment um, inside of the namespace or namespaces that it needs to run. 
So let's jump over and take a look at this example in the Amazon um, service operator. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, so there's some interesting stuff in here. Um, it, this is a, a lot of metadata about um, you know, the version of the operator and things like that. Um, embedded in this is actually an example of, uh, in this case, uh, running an uh, ECR repo. Um, if you were going to instantiate this, um, here is an actual version of that CRD that you can get started with um, and then tweak from there. So these are kind of like getting started templates, which are um, a really nice to have. Um, we've got a few of those. Um, you've got a description of the operator itself and its logo and things like that. Um, and then getting into the good stuff here, um, I want to call out this install mode. Um, so operators um, can either work across the entire cluster. Um, you can also scope them down a little bit more tightly into a set of namespaces or um, just a single namespace. And so this allows your operator to express how it needs to be installed on the cluster um, so that you don't need to worry about this. The cluster is just going to do that for you via the lifecycle manager. Um, in this case, all namespaces is true. So this um, Amazon operator is going to be looking for its CRDs inside of every single namespace. Um, but you can also put it uh, running in its own namespace as well. But it doesn't do single and it doesn't do multi. Um, here's that uh, deployment that I looked at. Um, I mostly wanted to show this to you so you can get an idea of kind of how, you're, how granular you're getting with these permissions. Um, this is, you know, looks like a Kubernetes RBAC object. Um, that's because that's exactly what it ends up being on the back end of this. Um, but it's all uh, tied together to the version of the operator. So if, uh, for example, you added a new component um, that needed to um, use a config map, but before you didn't use config maps. Um, getting a new version of that operator via this file um, has an updated permission. The lifecycle manager will wire that new permission up, and now you have access to use uh, config maps, for example. Um, so your application just got smarter, it got better, it's got better scalability, whatever the, the feature is based on the config map, um, and you didn't have to worry about anything. It all got wired up for you. Um, here's the actual deployment, which is not exciting. It's just in a deployment, um, and we're passing in a few of these parameters. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show you here is the custom resource definitions. This is um, the Amazon operator expressing the objects that it owns. Um, so here uh, it owns a kind of CloudFormation template. So if you did uh, kubectl get CloudFormation templates after this is installed, you would see all of those that the operator is managing. So I just want to give you a little sense under the hood of if you express a few of these parameters um, and get that from the experts, the folks that are building that operator, um, this is all stuff that you don't have to worry about. Um, and this is some, some of the type of stuff that we're testing for and looking at um, when things are listed on Operator Hub, just to make sure that they're not just getting like full root on your cluster, for example, is something that nobody wants. Um, and so that's what the Lifecycle Manager allows you to do. So, uh, Wanted to just circle back and uh, make sure that this is uh, really clear some of the, the awesome capabilities that you get from using an operator with the Lifecycle Manager is you get this self-service experience for your engineers. Um, so they've got a, a common place to go and uh, see all the tools available to them at their disposal um, that you as the admin of their cluster have installed. Um, so this is you know things like, oh, if I want to go get a stateful database, I've got Mongo, and I've got Redis, and I've got Postgres, I've got whatever it is um, installed, and these engineers can go to um, you know, your cluster catalog to go see what's available there, just like they would go to um, the cloud control panel of one of their favorite cloud providers to go get these types of services. But remember, you want to be truly hybrid. You don't want to be tied into that exact implementation of Amazon versus Google, um, but here you're providing a truly hybrid set of tools for your users to use. Um, and then at the end of the day, they have self-service. They're just expressing these very simple um, top-level configs for a Mongo database, for example, um, and getting that up and running. So you know they're prototyping really quickly. You're going to production. This thing can scale from a dev use case all the way up to something a lot bigger. And if you're practicing uh, this concept of GitOps, um, this makes your, your whole pipeline there very, very understandable and easy because it's really high level. So instead of uh, you know, your application being made up of like 35 different kube objects for all your services and config maps and these deployments and these service accounts and all that stuff, um, you're expressing these high level configs. So I've got you know, two tiers of my, my database or my database in my front end and that's my application. Um, you just have these two objects that you're managing um, for dev and production. 
And behind the scenes, you've got this operator that's baked in that actually has you know, all the steps uh, that would have uh, been done in like the run book or whatever to make that happen and can stamp out all of those kube resources. Um, so that stuff is there and you still get all the power of that inside of Kubernetes, but you're not managing it from a day-to-day -day level. So if you've got a new team member, for example, that needs to get like a dev environment set up, here are these two objects, go talk to your namespace and your kube cluster and they're good to go. Um, couldn't be more simple than that. Um, but then they actually get the complexity there where they can say, oh yeah, run this in actually production mode and you know, full HA and do all the, uh, everything that's required. Um, but then you get that inside of their little namespace um, and they don't need to be an expert at that application, which is really, really exciting. Um, then of course, uh, if you're running a cluster in the audience, um, you wanna have full control over this stuff and see what's going on. Um, so uh, inside of OpenShift, um, you've got access to all the operators that are installed on the cluster, the different modes that they're in. Um, you can go look at some of the access levels that they have um, and then see what their update status is. Um, if they've got security updates are available that you haven't applied, for example. Um, we want you to, to always know that you have full control over what's going on in that cluster, um, but then get out of everybody's way so that those teams can then be productive on their own. Um, lastly, I uh, want to encourage you to try this out. We've got a full getting started guide that talks through um, building your first operator with the SDK, um, plugging that into the lifecycle manager, getting that running on a cluster. Um, and then I want to invite you to come to um, continue the discussion in our operator SIG inside of OpenShift Commons. Um, this meets the third Friday of every month. Um, and so this is a great group of people that are either showing off operators that they built um, helping each other solve complex problems. Oh, hey, we had an issue with that. How did you solve you know, this inside of your application? That type of thing, as well as influencing the project roadmap, um, some of the things that we're working on next. How do we better instrument these operators, make them easier to scale, um, you know, possibly introduce new languages uh, for the SDK. Um, I think you know, uh, things like a Java operator uh, SDK would be pretty popular. So if you're interested in some of those topics, uh, please join us as well. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, and then, of course, go check out Operator Hub and go find some of these operators and try them out on your OpenShift cluster. Thank you all. That's all I have.